Thank you. Happy Sabbath again. It's the nice thing about Sabbath, you can say it more than once. So, happy Sabbath. I don't know if you noticed, but, uh, well, hopefully you'll notice. I really feel between Sabbath school and the children's story, uh, the sermon was already preached. So I'm hoping, by the grace of God, as we pray, we can see the connection. And the beautiful thing about it is that now we know that you didn't come to hear me. Now we know the Holy Spirit was speaking to us all along. He was doing it through Sabbath school. I had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with children's story. And by the way, I really don't have anything to do with the message. I'm just asking God to use me. I hope you're praying uh, for me. We're praying for one another that we can hear the voice of God this morning. Um, the title of our message this morning, of course, you see it there in the bulletin. If I was to be more accurate, I would probably say one of the great hindrance to salvation. One of the great hindrance to salvation. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved in God's kingdoms, in the kingdom. And I want to know every hindrance. Is there any hindrance in the way between me and, and, and allowing God to use me in my life? And so we're going to talk about one of those this morning. But before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer, if that's okay. Let's see what, I'm going, to bow, I'm going to kneel, and you can just bow your head if you like. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your mercy again. Thank you for that song that just really impressed my heart, and I know it impressed the hearts of others here. Thank you for speaking to us already through Sabbath school, through the children's story, through other ways. And Lord, we're asking for your mercy to speak with us again. Thank you. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, I ask you to go with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. One of my favorite spirit of prophecy books, The Desire of Ages, in the early chapters, it talks about the children of Israel and how they were looking for the Messiah. They were expecting the Messiah. They were talking about the Messiah. Some of you remember what I'm, what I'm talking about if you've read Desire of Ages. They were really looking for Jesus. But we know that when Jesus came, they did not know him. They did not receive him. And the Bible actually talks about that here in John chapter 1. And notice what the Bible says in beginning of verse 10. John chapter 1 and verse 10, for the sake of time, we're just going to go there. And the Bible says, and he, speaking of Christ, he was in the world. Are we there? I thought I heard some pages turning. All right. Let's begin again. Verse 10. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world did what? He knew him not. Verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And I don't want to stop with the, with the negative part of this passage, but let's go ahead and read verse 12, because verse 12 is beautiful. The Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. I'm so thankful that even though the majority of the world did not receive Jesus, the majority of his own people didn't even know who he was, Jesus says, listen, there were some who did receive me. And I'm very thankful for that. How about you? But it brings us to a question, why didn't the majority of the world receive him? Better yet, why didn't the people, the Jews, why didn't they receive Jesus? I want us to think about that this morning. I want us to be thinkers, not just, not just listening. I want us to think. What I want you to do, we're going to go through a number of verses, and I want you to think, what is the reoccurring, what's the thread that goes throughout these verses? Are you ready? If you have your Bible, go with me to Matthew chapter 9. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. And what we're looking for, we're looking for something that is reoccurring throughout each one of these verses. Matthew chapter 9. If you're there, let me know by saying amen. All right. There's some that are there. I'm getting there. Matthew chapter 9, and let's look at, we're going to look at verse 10. Now, notice what the Bible says here. Jesus had just called Matthew, and now, according to inspiration, he's actually eating at Matthew's house. Matthew, he's, he's been touched by Christ. He invites his friends, and that's what happens when you're converted. You can't keep it to yourself. You're actually telling other people about it. And so this is what's happening to Matthew. And in verse 10, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, 
They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what, what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but whom? But sinners to repentance. Jesus is sitting, sitting here with Matthew, and, and the, the publicans and sinners and Pharisees are saying, listen, why is he sitting with these publicans? Why is he sitting with these sinners? And Jesus says, listen, I'm not here for the whole. I came for those who are sick. Were the Pharisees sick? They were sick. Jesus wasn't saying they weren't sick. In fact, later in other passages, he says a lot about the Pharisees. At one point, he says, look, your righteousness and my righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. There was a higher standard. I'm not going to give it away just yet. Let's go to our next text. Go with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we're going to look at verse 10. Jesus said, I came not for those who are whole, but I came for those who are sick. Now notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 18. Are you there? Amen. Look at verse 10. Here's a story here. We're all familiar with this. It is a publican, and there's a, there's, a, there's a Pharisee here, and they're going to the temple. The Bible says, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, as other men are, and extortioners or extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, of course, he's standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Here we find another story here, and this is a Pharisee, and he looks at the public and he's like, look, you know what, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like him. Having a praise session to himself, he's like, I'm not an extortioner, I pay tithe, I even fast. That's what, the, that's what the, the Pharisee was saying. Go with me another passage, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I hope you're seeing the reoccurring theme in these passages, John chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. Actually, let's begin at verse 31. And it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful the truth can make us free. Verse 33. They answered, and, and they answered him, we be Abraham's seeds and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whomsoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Here it is, Jesus is talking to these disciples, and some of them are starting to believe and he said, listen, you know what? If you continue in my truth, you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And what is their response? Their response is like, praise the Lord, right? I'm like, wait a minute. We're not in bondage. We're Abraham's seed. We're free. We're free. When you look at these three passages, there's a reoccurring theme in each one of these stories that give you a mind or, or, or give you an insight into the mindset of the Jews. Can you want to tell me what was the reoccurring theme in these three stories? Well, you have some pride there, but my brother hit it. They did not see their need. The reason they couldn't make Jesus their personal savior is because they did not see their personal need. Wow. Go with me in your Bible to Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And yes, absolutely, the Jews, they, they had pride. They had so many things going on. They recognized they were looking for the Messiah, but the Messiah did not come the way they thought that he should have came. He did not come that way. They were looking for a Messiah, of course, to, to save them from the injustice, the social injustice of the Romans. They were looking for the Messiah to come and say, well, you know what, let's make the Jewish nation great again. 
They were focused on the Messiah doing all these different things. But what Jesus was coming to tell them is, listen, you have a specific need, and that's the thing I'm coming to show you. Notice what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 18. I mean, Luke chapter 4, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 18. Here it is, Jesus speaking in Nazareth. He grew up in Nazareth, and Jesus comes to preach in Nazareth. And notice what what he says here in verse 18. And Jesus speaks, let's begin in verse 16. It says, and he came to pass, or and he came to Nazareth, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And notice what Jesus says. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What's the condition of these people? They're poor. He says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What is their condition? They're brokenhearted. He says, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It says, and he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the Bible says, And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. Ellen White actually, she demonstrates, she talks about the idea that when he finished, by the way, we we don't have all the comments here, but Ellen White says that Jesus was actually commenting on that passage. He was actually actually coming, giving a commentation. He was kind of like giving a small sermon on these thoughts. And the people were like, they were so moved. They were like, wow. You know, if they were in church, they were like, Amen. Like, wow, that is powerful. How is he able to, to dictate and show us clearly what these prophecies were saying? But then Jesus said something. Verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And the people responded. And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this is, this, is not this Joseph's son? Now you might say, well, what was wrong with that, what they just said? We're talking about the idea they didn't see their need. I want to read you a quote of what Ellen White says. This is in the book, uh, I believe this is Desire of Ages. Yes, Desire of Ages, page 237. Notice what she says. She says, Jesus stood before the people as a living expositor of the prophecies concerning himself. Explain the words he had read. He spoke of the Messiah as the, a reliever of the oppressed, a liberator of, cap, of captives, a healer of the afflicted, restoring sight to the blind, the revealing to the world the light of truth. His impressive manner and the wonderful import of his words thrilled the hearers with a power they, they had never felt before. So they were like, wow, this is thrilling what Jesus is saying. But then he continues, she's continued. She says, the tide of divine influence broke Every barrier down, like Moses, they beheld the invisible. As their hearts were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, they responded with fervent amens and praise the Lord. As Jesus was preaching, they were saying, Amen. They knew, like, this, he is, this is powerful. How did he do that? The Holy Spirit was moving on their hearts. But then she says, But when Jesus announced, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. They were suddenly recalled to think of themselves and of the claims of him who had been addressing them. They, Israelites, children of Abraham, had been represented as in bondage. They had been addressed as prisoners to be delivered from the power of evil, as in darkness they and needed, needing the light of truth. Their pride was offended. Someone mentioned that. It says, and their fears were, were roused. The words of Jesus indicated that his work for them was to be altogether different from what they desired. Their deeds might be investigated too closely. Now watch this. Notwithstanding their exactness in outward ceremonies, they shrank from the inspection by those clear searching eyes. They loved the sermon of Jesus. But as soon as Jesus said, listen, you know this condition I'm describing? That's you. As soon as Jesus got pointed with what was going on in their heart, they didn't want to see it. And what I want to submit to you this morning is that the reason, one of the biggest reasons why the Jews rejected Jesus 
because they felt they didn't need him. They felt they didn't need him. I wish I could say that they're only that that problem only was stay with the Jews. I wish I could say that. But you know the Bible says in the last days speaks about a church and God says they have the exact same condition. Go with me in your Bible to Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse, I, I, I praise the Lord for my brother reading the passage this morning. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus gives a message. This is the last church. And Jesus gives a message to them. But before, as he comes to give them the message, he first of all has to share with them their condition. And notice what he says in verse uh, 14. Revelation 3, verse 14 says, And unto the angel of the church of, Laodice, of the Laodiceans write, these things said the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert, wert hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's Laodicea. And my friends, I have news for you. That's us. That's us. We, like the Jews, could pay our tithe. We, like the Jews, can keep all the, well, we say, we keep all the commandments, right? We go to church on Sabbath. We, like the Jews, can dress nicely in our dresses, and we can dress in our suits, and we can say amen, and we can do all this outwardly righteous works, we, like the Jews, talk about the second coming of Jesus. We, like the Jews, are saying, wow, we're expecting the Messiah. We, like the Jews, can say all these wonderful things, but Jesus says there's a problem there. You have a deep need, but you don't know it. And my friends, I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking about me. I have a deep need, and I don't know it. I didn't know it. God, how can you fix this need? How can you fix this need? When I was thinking about this message, I was thinking, Lord, if there's anything our church needs now, we need to know how Jesus can fix the need. If there's anything I need now, I need to know how Jesus can fix this great need. I want to give you um, just some short principles here, but the first thing I want to share with you, notice the next verse. Because God has a wonderful solution to fix the need. We, we, we love to talk about it. What is the need? What are the three things God comes to them with? He said, look, I, I counsel to buy me. Go try in the fire. He says, white raiment, eye salve so that thou, thou mayest, you know, eye salve so you can see. White raiment so you can, you can have the, the, you won't be naked. And he says, and go try in the, in the fire so that you can be rich. But the problem is we don't know it. We don't know it. So how will God fix our need? Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 18, watch what Jesus says. I counsel thee to buy of me, what everyone? Gold tried in the fire. I'm, not, I'm going to stop right there for, the, for just what the point we're trying to make. I have a question for you. Why would Jesus ask poor people to buy from him? Have you ever thought about that? Why would Jesus ask poor people to buy from him? Someone says on sale. I have a story I want to share with you. When I first started working at, at a store called Sears, um, it was my first time. In fact, I think I opened a bank account because I started working at that store. And I had some jobs before, but this job was a little different in how, as to how they, they used our, um, how they paid us. Because generally you get paid, I always got paid with checks, I always got paid with cash. But this was the first time I was ever going to get paid with a direct deposit. And so they just sort of tell you, like, look, you're going to go in, you know, you're going to get paid on this date. We're going to direct it straight to your bank. So I had to, get a, I had to, had to open up a bank account. I, I don't know. I can't remember if I had a bank account open or not. But I just remember this is the first time I'm getting direct deposit. So uh, my first check starts to come around. I've been working there for just a few weeks. My first check starts, I think it was like two weeks. My first check starts to come around. And around that time, I end up having some problems with my, with my car, it wasn't any huge problems, just the fact that I needed new tires. 
So I thought, I decided to myself, well, I'm going to go over to, I went to the, the, the Walmart tire shop. I was like, man, that's the ones I can afford. So I went over there, and I get in, I get in line, and uh, I had this new bank card. You know, I knew that that date that, the, um, that the, my check had gone into my bank account. And I'm in line, I'm waiting, and finally I know what I want to get. I get to the front of the line, there's people behind me, and I give them my card, and the guy takes my card, and he uh, runs it, and it comes up, uh, like, declined. And I was like, hmm. I didn't, I was like, I never had this happen. So I was like, run it again. And he ran it again, and it was like, decline. Okay. So then he was like, sir, I'm sorry, but I don't think we can take your card. And I'm like, what's going on? What's happening? And now by this time, I'm embarrassed. I have all these people behind me. So I'm like, I have to go find out what's going on. So I go and I try to go to the bank and I try to find out what's going, out, going on. And what I found out was, even though there was, they would send the check to my account, there was a processing period. And so when I went to use my card, I thought I had money, but I actually did not. I was actually broke. But I didn't know it until I went to buy. I didn't have sufficient funds until I went to buy. I thought about this. I was like, wait a minute, wait, that's Laodicea. Laodicea thinks, oh, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I have this experience. And Jesus is like, okay, you're rich. Come buy of me. Come get that experience from me. And we're like, hey, I got what it takes to get that experience. So we go to Jesus, and we go to Jesus. We're like, Lord, you know what? I'm rich. I pray. I go to church. I do these different things. But when we go get the experience, like something's not right. I still feel empty. I have my devotions. I know I get up early in the morning, but I still feel empty. I'm doing all these different things. And God is like, listen, it's once you start to try to get that experience that you realize I am empty. There's nothing I can do to obtain the experience I want. It's not until you buy. It's not until you buy. Question is, how do we get that experience? Before I talk about how we get that experience, there's something I've been noticing. I've been working with young people probably for about 10 years now. And it's not just young people, but it's older people alike. You know, something I notice about when I've worked with young people, I've noticed that there has been ways we try to get that experience. There's some of us, I've noticed that they come into church like, wow, I really want this powerful experience with God. I want God to work in my life. And so there's some that's like, well, I'm going to really be zealous. I'm going I'm to go out and I'm going to change my whole life. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to start dressing a certain way. I'm going to stop listening to that certain music. I'm going to start to, to eat this certain way, and I'm going to start making sure everyone else is doing it too, right? I'm going to start, hey, brother, you know what? You're doing such and such. You need to stop. And we, I'm going to be zealous for God. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to, look, I'm going to be faithful. And I've seen those same young people later on. It's like, look, you know what? I feel empty. I've been doing all these works. I've been doing all these different things, but I still feel empty. I have not experienced God. Not really. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to have devotions and dress a certain way. But they would try to do the works without really getting the experience, the relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> then I see another group of young people. And they're like, oh, you know what? I don't want to be that type of person. I just want a relationship with Jesus. And so, you know what? I'm going to take my same worldly music. I'll just do it for Jesus now. And I'll, I'll play my songs. And I'll, I'll, I'll rap now, but I'll rap for Jesus now. And I'm, you know, I'm going to do all these different things. And, hey, you know what? You don't have to obey. You, know, you don't have to do all that stuff. You know, just don't be, don't be so, don't, don't judge, right? But I talk to those same young people, and guess what? They're still depressed. They're doing all these different things. And when I look at that, I say, Lord, what's really going on? What's happening is you have two groups of young people who are trying to buy an experience, but they're really broke. They're doing these things like, if I'm going to get with Jesus, then I'm going I'm to straighten up and I'm going to do all these different things, but it's not working. You have the other set, it's like, if I'm going to get with Jesus, I'm just going to focus on the relationship, forget all those different things, but it's not working. And Jesus is saying, listen, you need me. You need me. So the question is, how does God help us to recognize how much we need him? Go with me in your Bible. There's two ways. There's two ways that we can recognize how much God needs us. Then we're going to talk about the solution, and then we'll wrap up. Notice that come with me in your Bible to James chapter 1. How do I discover how much I need Jesus? I just want to read a couple of passages with you. 
James chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 2 through 5. We're familiar with this passage. How do I get an experience with Jesus? How do I recognize? Of course, we try these different things. We still feel empty. But how does Jesus bring us to the point that we say, Lord, I need Jesus? By the way, here's something that, uh, that, that I really want to bring out. The problem of, of many of us, the reason why we try to, we may be doing a lot of good things, and there's nothing wrong with the good things, but what we don't realize is that there's something in our life that we haven't surrendered to Jesus. So we do all these good things, but there's that something, and what God wants us to help us to see is what is that thing? What is that thing that we haven't opened Jesus up so that he can come in? He's knocking on our door or the door of our hearts, but there's some things that's in our way, and sometimes we don't see it. So how does God help us to see it? James chapter 1, verse uh, 2 through 5. It says, My brother, encounter all joy when, we, when, we, when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. And what's the next phrase? Wanting nothing, or some, some may say lacking nothing. So here it is, you are lacking, I'm lacking, and sometimes we don't know what we're lacking until we get into a situation. So let's just say, for example, you're the type of person like, oh, I'm a pretty patient person. <laughs> like, I'm pretty patient. Like, wow, surely Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to take me. I'm a loving person, right? But then you start to drive in your car, and suddenly, you know, you're, you're busy today. You're like, wow, you're just driving, but you're still trying to be patient. Oh, wow, you know. And suddenly someone's kind of like, Man, you, 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 maybe you weren't, maybe they think you're too patient or whatever, but they just like cut in front of you, and then you're just like, what? You're, like, you, you, you're yelling, right? You're, you're upset. Why did they, didn't they see my car? They didn't even put their blinker on. Like, what is wrong? And then God's like, hmm, you're lacking my spirit. You're lacking me. God puts us in situations so we can see where we're lacking. Now, we could get to that point and say, okay, Lord, I'm lacking. There's nothing I can do about this. But God says, look, don't lose hope. Notice the next verse. He says this, but let him, oh, let's read verse 5. It says, if any of you, what? Lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. So Jesus says, listen, if you go through the trial and you see you're lacking, don't lose hope, don't lose heart. Come to me. Come to me. Let's talk about this. Let's deal with this. You're lacking. It's okay, but you need me. That's one way God shows us our lack. The second way God shows us our lack, go with me to Romans chapter 5. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. We're very familiar with this passage, but I can tell you when I thought about this passage, like, wow, that's how God shows us our lack. Jesus says, by the way, he says, come let us what? Reason together. God wants to reason with us. God wants to talk to us. He wants to hear us talk to him in prayer, but then he wants to start showing us, and our hearts have to be open to that. But notice what it says in Romans chapter 5, and look at verse 20. It says, Moreover, the law entereth, entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. This verse is very, very interesting. I want to suggest to you that the sin, the sin that the Bible is talking about here, the sin in your life, it didn't get any worse in the sight of God. The grace that he offers to us, it didn't get any greater in the sight of God. The difference of this verse is that when the law came in and God started to show us our hearts, we start realizing, whoa, that is bad. That's really sin. God has to reveal that by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and this is why spending time in the Word of God is so important. This is why a, a, a preacher preaching the straight testimony is so important. Let me try to illustrate it to you. You and I, we might look and say, like, you know what? That person watches really, really bad horror movies. I don't. I watch Christian movies. But those Christian movies aren't sharing the gospel. But I'm a pretty good person. As we start to spend time with God, God is saying, listen, you see, there's that portion of the movie. It's actually taking your heart away from me. It might say a Jesus movie, but look, it's taking your heart away from me. Some of my students not too long ago, they came to me and they were like, oh, Mr. Anthony, you got to check this out. It's really exciting. Have you listened to The Chosen? Watch The Chosen. And I was like, I haven't watched it, but they said, you got to see this. This is so good. And, and, you know, 
I, I've seen a few movies. I used to watch, watch them with my uncle. I used to like examine them, different things. But I was really concerned because I know they were like, it's so good, it's so accurate. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to skim through it, skim through it. And I did. I kind of skimmed through it, and I was like, Lord, first of all, from a movie standpoint, it's not like all these other um, Jesus movies that people try to make. I said, like, they were really good, really good. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I was like, this is really good. But one of the things I noticed as I watched it, I was like, wow, anyone reading the Bible should see these small discrepancies. Like, the story was very discrepant. So I had to go back to my students. I was like, oh, man. I was like, guys, you know? I was like, you know what? If you ask my opinion, the way they filmed it, excellent. I mean, they were really good. This is not some cheap budget movie. I said, but I have to tell you. I said, that's what made it more scary for me. Because I saw some discrepancies there. And then I know if I was just watching it for movie sake, boy, it'd be so good. I'd probably miss, if they have those discrepancies, what other errors are, are in there? What other doctrinal errors are in there that will cause my mind to be turned from God? I was like, man, I can't get my stamp of approval of it. And they were like, we never saw that. We never saw that. But how often is it that we can look and we can say, wow, you know, those are the bad things. But God comes to us and say, listen, see that thing right there? And this is why most people don't like the Laodicean message, by the way. It's pointed not because someone's coming like, hey, you know what? You're doing this. You know, yeah, yeah. You need, you know, and you're trying to just be mad at you when they're rebuking you. The reason why it's more pointed than that of John the Baptist is because God and the Holy Spirit come and say, look, I'm going to be more pointed to what that thing is, the sin. That's what's making it pointed. You can share with the love of Jesus, but you have to share it and say, look, that's the thing. Thou art the man, so to speak. And that's what makes it pointed. And a lot of us don't like that. We don't like that. I want you to go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. I want to share a story with you. Matthew chapter 19. We're, we're wrapping up here. Matthew chapter 19. How does Jesus show us our condition? And by the way, this is a beautiful story because I shouldn't say so much a beautiful story. It's kind of a sad story. But the question is also, how should we respond? Do you know this story? There's actually the story of the rich man, I mean, um, not the rich man in Lazarus, the rich young ruler. Everybody's, anyone familiar? Everyone's familiar with that? Rich young ruler. I want us to do something this morning. When we read this rich young ruler, by the way, I should ask this question. In Revelation, who is the true witness? It's Jesus. So can you tell me if the, the true witness is in this, in, in this story? Do we see the true witness in this story? Jesus is in this story, isn't he? I want you to look at Jesus, not just Jesus the Messiah walking on earth. I want you to look in this story. Jesus is the true witness in the story. The rich young ruler, guess who that's going to be? That's us. That's Laodicea. Watch this story. Matthew chapter 19, beginning verse 16, it says this. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master. We need to find out how is it that God is going to show this man or, or what is, how does God deal with him? How does he show him his, his, his need? He says, and behold, one came unto him saying, good master, what good thing shall what? Shall I do that I may enter into eternal life? This is Laodicea. Lord, what good thing can Laodicea do? It may enter into eternal life. Notice what Jesus says. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. I want us to understand what Jesus is doing here. And a lot of people say, well, you know, we, we do recognize that Jesus was trying to get this man to see, like, hey, you're not just talking to the good master. You're talking to the Messiah. You're talking to the Son of God. You're talking to God here. If you, if you think I'm good, then think about what you're saying. But there's something else Jesus is trying to tell him. No man can do anything good. No one can do anything good but who? But God. But notice what this young man says. He says, good master, what good thing can? This was Jesus telling him, look, there's nothing good that you can do. He missed it. Jesus was like, look, there's nothing good you can do. And then he totally missed it. He didn't even catch it. And so Jesus said, okay, well, if you want to do anything good, they'll strike one. Jesus says, okay, keep the commandments. Notice what the young man says next. He says, he said unto him, which? So he still didn't get it. Jesus is like, all right, keep the commandments. He says, which? Jesus said, thou shalt, not, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother that, that thy days may be, um, or I'm sorry, I'm going on. He said, that shalt, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And the young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. So he's still not getting it. He's like, Jesus is like, okay, strike two. You know, strike one, you can't do anything good, only God. He's like, okay, well, what do I do? And Jesus is like, keep the commandments. Oh, yeah, I've done all those for my youth up. But now the next thing Jesus is going to do to him, he's about to turn to the true witness. He's about to get really pointed with him. And notice what he says. He says this. And he says, um, Jesus said unto him, verse 21, if thou wilt be perfect, God's trying to perfect his church. He says, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, Isaiah 58. And thou, some, some people have caught that, I'm sure. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Verse 22, and when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said, then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. When he heard what Jesus said, he was like, Jesus got so pointed with him, he was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I want to suggest to you that in Laodicea, many people are going to be shaken and sifted out of the church because the testimony of the true witness. When the testimony of the true witness comes to their heart, they're going to be like, oh man, I'm a Christian, I'm a this, I'm a that. And, but once it comes to them personally, they'll say, I can't do it can't do it. But my friends, there's hope in this story. And I say this, if only the rich young ruler would have stayed just a little bit longer, like you and I, if only we just like, when Jesus shows us things, don't give up in discouragement and walk away. Just hang with Jesus. Keep beholding him. Watch what the story says next. The Bible says this, and it says, and the disciples said in verse 24, and again, I say unto you, um, well, let's go to verse 25. It says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? Did, God, did Jesus lift the standard for them? Yeah, he is. they were like, who then can be saved? And what I want to submit to you is that that's where we need to be. We have to come to, to the point where we look at the law of God and say, who then can be saved? That's where we have to be. This is what I love. Notice, the Bible says this, Jesus said, and it says, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, how much is possible? That was the righteous by faith text. Jesus like, listen, with you, it's impossible. But that's why we have Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Because it's impossible for you, but you cannot accept Revelation 14, 12 until you recognize who then can be saved. You can't accept it. You have to recognize, Lord, all my righteousness are filthy rags. He's like, yep, that's exactly where I needed you. With you, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. I love this story because the story starts off, it says, in the beginning, only God is good. At the end, the story says, God can be good in you. That's the story. That's our experience. So then the last thought I want to share with you is, what then is the solution? How does God look when he fixes us? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 55. I want to just read this passage. One last passage, we'll close. Because I want to leave you with the solution that God gives us. Isaiah chapter 55. You know, in, in Revelation chapter uh, 3, we see God says, look, come buy of me gold, try in the fire. And, um, and we know we don't have any money, but Isaiah 55 addresses that. What is it that we need to do then? What is it that we need to do? Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at verse 1. Are you there? All right. The Bible says this. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, God knows we don't have any money. It says, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? You're trying to get an experience, but you're not, you're not getting it. And it says, and um, for that bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not. And then it says, hearken diligently unto me. I had a teacher that, that Mr. Mr. Pruitt used to teach class. He said, you know what? The only thing God wants us to pay is to pay attention. Hearken. I love that. I always love that. He says, hearken unto me diligently unto me and eat ye that, ye that which uh, eat, ye that which is good. And let your soul delight in fatness. And then it says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. 
And God gives a promise. And this is the promise I want to leave with us this, this morning. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. God says, look, come to me. And what I want to give you is the sure mercies of David. Here's my question. Does anyone know what the sure mercies of David is? It's forgiveness. Go to 2 Samuel. You don't have to go there now, but when you go, go back home, go read 2 Samuel chapter 7. In that, in that um, story, God makes a covenant with, with David, and there's two things you see that happens. God gives him victory over his enemies, and God establishes his throne. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound familiar? Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, God talks to Laodicea. He says, listen, he that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set with my father in his throne. If we come to Jesus and buy, Jesus says to us today, whatever that thing is you're struggling with, you can have victory over your enemies. And our enemies ultimately is Satan. God wants to give us victory so we can sit with him in his throne. My question this morning is simply this. Do we recognize our need? I put myself there. You know what, honestly, I can say for myself, I don't really recognize how much I need Jesus. But my, my desire is that I want to recognize how much I need Jesus. And if that's what your desire is this, this morning, this afternoon, if you want to say, Lord, I want to recognize how much I need Jesus, I want to ask you to stand with me. We just want to commit our hearts and say, Lord, help us. We want to recognize how much we need Jesus. We think we're okay. We think we look good. But Lord, help us to recognize it. Give us your Holy Spirit to recognize we're poor. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we recognize the condition of the children of Israel of old is the same condition that we have today. And Lord, you want to come to us. You want us to see our condition. You want us to be very pointed with us. You want to show, uh, not, not, Lord, I'm not thinking about everyone here in this sense, but I'm thinking about me. Lord, you want to show me what the problems are in my heart. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. And you want to do that for each of us individually. Help us not to walk away from that pruning. Help us not to walk away from that cutting, but accept the, the grace that, Lord, what's impossible for us to do is possible for you. Lord, thank you for this promise, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so pleased you can join us for this special event here at Watch the Hills Academy and College. If you've been blessed by these presentations just as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.